What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. This week, I want to discuss where I think interest rates are going. Now, remember, this is a real estate investment podcast stroke channel. If I'm talking about a topic, it is because I believe it's going to impact the market. And uh, when you're listening to podcasts and things like that, or you know, channels in YouTube, wherever it might be, you got to keep an open mind because uh, a lot of the time I find uh, people switch off their mind if they don't agree with something or if they don't like what they're hearing or perhaps it's not specific to their local market. And so they're kind of thinking this doesn't, you know, this doesn't involve me. So I'm just going to kind of switch off. And that is where you might be making a mistake. And the reason I say that is because we live now in a global economy and everything is interlinked everything is kind of interwoven and so whether or not you're looking at something about the us market the uk market the australian market the asian market the eu market or indeed my local market here in ireland they're all some way interconnected and they kind of vibrate on each uh you know the actions and the dynamics of the various markets so you've got to be really careful to kind of pay attention to them You know, one market impacts another sector, another sector impacts another market. They all kind of have these knock-on impacts. And so I just would suggest that you guys pay attention to these different channels, these different sources of information. And indeed, you know, this channel here, if this episode initially doesn't sound like something that would be of interest, you know, where is interest rates going? A lot of people will be interested, but there might be some of you out there thinking, oh, this sounds boring, I'm just going to switch off. This is something that you probably want to pay attention to because I do think it could impact the market for the next couple of years. And whenever you hear these kind of or see these signals, flags, points, uh, you know, they're pointing towards trends and patterns. You need to pay attention to this stuff because over time you will develop a kind of a sense of where the market is going and you can adapt your investment style to kind of suit the market pattern or the or the trend or, or whatever way it's going. And I don't want you to miss something um, that would put you at a disadvantage just because it doesn't initially sound like something that is of interest. So with that said, let us get into this week's show, which is all about how high I think interest rates are going to go. You are listening to Behind the Facade and I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher. On this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. All right, guys, look, this week, uh, it's going to be a short enough episode, uh, but it's going to be a punchy and it's going to be important episode that I want you to pay attention to. And uh, I think over the next two to three years, you could see, we could see a whole generation of investors wiped out. And why would that happen? Well, because I think they're going to fail to read the signals or they're going to choose to ignore them because they don't like what they see. And um, it's this weekend, by the way, is my birthday weekend. I've just turned a big decade, new decade number. And, uh, and so like, I want to get back to my celebrations. Um, but before I leave you guys, I want to give you some solid, uh, what I believe anyway, to be solid advice and some guidance. Take on board what I'm saying and kind of keep an open mind and listen to the other commentators out there and Maybe they'll say something that you prefer to hear, but just remember, there's those cognitive biases that I've mentioned before. And a lot of time, the information that you don't want to hear is the information that you probably need to hear. And it's the information that you like to hear is the one that kind of misleads you and forces you off down a road and gets you into trouble. So last Friday, the 26th of August, um, we had an event take place in the US and Now, I mentioned already, just because this is the US, if you're sitting in Ireland or if you're sitting in the UK or indeed Australia or any other market, I know we have listeners in South Africa, 
I know we have listeners in the Czech Republic, in Cyprus. I've seen all of your names. I've, I've sometimes know who you are. And the, the reality is these events that take place in America, usually they have an impact on the rest of the world because when America catches a cold, the rest of the world often gets pneumonia, as they say. So what happened on the 26th? Well, Friday last was the uh, a speech was given by the Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell. And the speech only lasted 10 minutes, so it wasn't a very long speech. But in those 10 minutes, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos experienced about an 80 billion fall in their net worth. And, you know, why, how can such a small, short speech have such an impact? Um, well, that's what I'm going to get into today. He was speaking at a, a thing called a symposium in Jackson's Hole in Wyoming, of all places. And in those 10 minutes, he destroyed the stock market and it crashed almost instantly. And why? And well, that's what we're about to get into. You see, there is a kind of what I see as uh, an irrational optimism, certainly in the, in the stock market these days. And people do not seem to want to believe that the party is over or that it could be over. And they just don't want to accept that, you know, the days of easy money where you can kind of double your portfolio over a year or two, that those days could be behind us. And it's the very same, if you look at, this, at the crypto market, like the crypto market had this massive fall and a lot of people got kind of really badly wiped out. And there's, I've actually heard recently that there is a, in the UK somewhere, there is actually a, a clinic that treats depression amongst crypto investors. And some of these investors have lost what could have been the value of a house. And this house you know, they, they, could have, they could have sold their crypto, they could have bought a house for cash, and they could have actually started a business. And instead, they kept their money in crypto, and the crypto collapsed. And now they're sitting on crypto with a value of about 10, euro, 10 pounds or 10 euro or something like that. And they were once worth maybe 500,000 or something. So there was a lot of easy money in the market. The market corrected, and everything fell but it, there has been this huge bull or this kind of bear rally as they call it. And it's where the market fell a huge amount and now it's bounced back and it's bounced back with a vengeance and everyone feels that, you know, things are, things are on, the, on the way up again. It's great, let's get in, let's pile into the market. And, and so the last couple of weeks, if you've been in the market, you've been doing really, really well. That's where this becomes the kind of difficult because people like the upward only, you know, the pumping market is just, is a, is a great feeling. There's a lot of enthusiasm in the air. You feel good. There's a feel good factor, all that kind of stuff. Everyone is piling in. And um, there was this automatic assumption amongst all of that gang that, that piled into the market, that things were starting to improve, that Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve were not going to continue to hike interest rates into this kind of really painful level they've gone quite a lot up in like if you look at it the u.s market has gone from effectively zero to about two and a half percent and that might not sound like much but when you're when you're paying a margin on top of that like most people who were borrowing uh, say a year ago were borrowing for 30 years at three uh, two and a half percent or something like that those rates now are up closer to kind of five percent or six percent and so it's, you know, there's a noticeable difference. But that's where people thought that the market was going to stop. And this is where he basically put a big pin in that balloon. And uh, so what happens is markets adjust. They, they, they build in their kind of, they, they update their model. They were, interest rates were very, very low for a long time. Everyone got used to that. Everyone kind of assumed the market's going to continue to grow rapidly. And suddenly it uh, turns out not to be the case. Inflation has crept in. Nobody kind of saw it coming. And Jerome Powell has been fighting inflation. But everyone thought that the big 2.5% increase that had happened in the last while, that that was it. There wasn't going to be any more increases. And everyone was saying the reason for this is because the Fed is not going to want to damage the economy. 
It's not want to. It, it's not going to want to trigger a recession. It's not going to want to increase the unemployment rate. And so all of these other factors are going to kind of hamper its ability to deal with inflation. And even though inflation might need much, much more pain, they're just going to kind of brush that under the carpet and they're going to try and keep everything all, everybody all happy at the same time. And that was the working assumption that most investors have been making in the last while. So Friday, that was wiped off the table by Jerome Powell. He came out and said that they're going to do whatever it takes to uh, get inflation back from where it is at the moment. In the US, it is running at 8%, and they need to get it down to 2%. And uh, everyone suddenly realized, whoa, what does, you know, he actually said what this means. He said it's going to mean pain, it's going to mean unemployment, it's going to mean uh, economic growth stalls and falls backwards, and that there could be a lot of job losses, and there could be a lot of businesses under pressure and stuff. Now, Going out and saying this kind of stuff, obviously, he's not very popular right now. But people suddenly realize, whoa, he's serious about inflation. And the reason he is, is because there's a, this historical record of how it was attempted to fix inflation back in the 70s. At the moment, interest rates are running at the highest they've been in 40 years. And what's happened is, there's all this history showing that back in the 1970s, when interest was, when inflation was at a similar level, they, they try to do this thing where they want to keep everyone happy. Nobody wants to damage the economy or create a recession, and certainly not the when there's a presidential election coming up or any of that kind of stuff. What usually happens is the politicians get involved and they start putting pressure on the bank and all this kind of stuff, and I'll make sure that you don't go and damage the economy because that'll wreck my, my voting prospects. In this case, we're currently at a, an interest or an inflation rate of 8%. That is four times higher than the base target rate that they're trying to get to. So for him to actually fight it, he's going to have to lift interest rates to a much, much higher level. They, uh, and, and that's what he had to remind everyone there on Friday, that he is nowhere near done yet and that there is a lot of pain to come. And fighting inflation is the number one priority. And the historical record that they have is that in the past, when people tried to kind of keep everyone happy, that what had happened is inflation came back and it came back with a vengeance and it really, really caused more damage because the stuff that they do to kind of get inflation down does create some pain. And then as soon as the pain is felt, they kind of like say, okay, ease off now. And then inflation starts to rise again and they have to start the whole process again. What they want to do is get in, fight it in one fell swoop and get it down, get it back to 2% and then they'll be done. And that'll take as long as it takes. And that spooked everyone in the market. They suddenly realized, oh, holy crap, we, we are not prepared for this. Our models are all based on this assumption that things are going to continue rising and they're not. So what... Is he saying, in other words, he is just saying, hey, everyone, get ready for some real economic pain. And there were all these investors around the world speculating that this was not going to happen, that he would not dare mess with economic growth or jobs. Wrong. Pain is coming and it's going to be felt by a lot of investors and a lot of people, like people working in jobs. There's going to be a lot of job losses probably from this action. And as unpopular as that is, he has to do it because inflation, once it becomes embedded in an economy, it's sort of there and you can't shake it out. And then it affects people even more because the people who are losing their jobs, you know, the, the social welfare that they're getting and that they're living on, whatever, that doesn't cover the basics any longer because inflation is running so high. And so it affects everybody and, and pretty badly. So what are, what are interest rates likely to do? Well, he, he needs to get the inflation rate back down to 2%, and it's currently running at 8%. And a lot of people, a lot of historical kind of uh, records would suggest that if you want to get interest, uh, if you want to get inflation down, you have to get your interest rates up to the level that your inflation is at, which in the US's case, that would mean about 8% interest rates. Now, 
I that is quite possibly where it's going. But at the moment, everyone is just too scared and too spooked to even suggest that. What they're now starting to do is say, okay, we're going to go from 25 to 5%. But again, I think this is this kind of tepid approach that people take. They don't want to assume, you know, too much. They don't, they can't believe it's possible for rates to go from 2 to 8%. But that is quite possibly what's going to have to happen. It's, it's very hard to say. Like, this is crystal ball gazing. But we are dealing with inflation that is the highest in 40 years. And so what kind of economic models and projections can you rely on if you're dealing with something that you haven't seen for 40 years? You have to go back and look at what happened 40 years ago and how it was dealt with at the time. So it is a little bit uh, unnerving for most investors. Now, the 5% rate in the U.S. is going to destroy uh, a lot of jobs, and it's going to put a lot of businesses... I've got a fly buzzing around my head here. It's going to put a lot of businesses out of business. And so, sorry to say, a lot of in property and real estate investors are going to be impacted by this. People that were locking away, you know, uh, these long interest rates, and so if those days are gone, you're now looking at much, much higher rates. And... But... You know, let's let's take our eyes now off the U.S. market and just look back. Look at the, the U.K. market or the Irish market. Like, surely the same thing is not going to happen here. Well, not so fast. Like, what is inflation running at here, back here? Like, let's have a look at the U.K. Interest, sorry, I keep saying interest. Inflation in July of this year came in officially in the U.K. at 10%. Okay. The Bank of England is going to have to fight inflation in the same way that the U.S. is. They're going to have to increase rates substantially. And they're going to be probably slower to do this because, uh, first of all, they're trying to navigate Brexit. And Brexit is already creating all this kind of damage to the economy. So you go and massively increase interest rates and you're just going to create a massive recession. So there's going to be a huge pushback against that. And it's quite possible that they'll have to tinker around with it as well. But I think there's also a risk that we're going to have that kind of inflation creeping into the UK market and getting embedded there. And then they're going to have to do something like this. So again, it's a worrying time. What about the Irish market? Well, who sets the interest rates for borrowing in Ireland? It's, it's not the Irish government. It's the ECB, the European Central Bank. So based on the European economy, you have to look at, like, Ireland is only a tiny market in the, U in, the East, in the EU market. What are the bigger markets? You've got Germany. What's inflation in Germany at the moment? 7.5% in July. What's uh, inflation running at in Spain at the moment? It's running at 10.8%. What about France? France is a bit better at 6.1%. What about the Netherlands? The Netherlands is quite a powerhouse. They've got 10.3% inflation. Italy is running at 8.4% inflation at the moment. So I'm sorry, but I do think that the ECB is going to be forced to increase rates to combat this inflation. And as you have seen over the years, what tends to happen is America acts quickly and, and makes these bold moves. And then the rest of the world kind of wakes up and goes, geez, we're going to have to do that too. And I think that is probably what's going to happen. All right, so let's leave all the doom and gloom aside for one second, and let's just take a moment to reflect on it, okay? We've seen massive economic growth rates over the last, you know, 10 years, essentially, at this stage. Interest rates have been at or close to zero for that entire time, or certainly most of it. That was then. We are in a new era now, and we've got to adjust to that. And there is going to be pain for all of us. But remember... The one thing that I think that can s separate you as an investor from other, from the rest of the market, is your mindset when it comes to investment. Mindset is absolutely critical. Your emotions, controlling your emotions, all of that stuff is critical. So am I staying, am I, what am I saying? Am I saying you shouldn't be buying and you shouldn't be piling into the market? Well, I am saying don't pile into the market, but I'm not saying stop all activity and like hang up your boots and say, I'm not an investor anymore. That would be a real mistake. I do think we, you know, things are 
going to get difficult. Um, but that is actually the reason why you should be thinking about continuing on or getting into the market. It's because it's going to be difficult. That's why you want to get into the market. You've got to take this kind of counterintuitive approach and steal yourself for the new reality. Now, if you're, if you're used to, if you've been investing for the last 10 years, you've gotten all too used to an easy time. Buying things, they go up, all that kind of stuff. Lots of tenants around, all of that. You've got to be careful not to allow yourself to be soft. Start to harden your position and start to kind of think to yourself, okay, things are going to get difficult. Interest rates are going to increase. I've got to push for much, much better terms in my loans. Uh, when I'm buying property, I'm going to have to push for a harder bargain. You're probably going to want to sit on the sidelines and just watch prices fall back a bit. Um, but people who pile in with optimistic projections, I think they're going to end up going bankrupt. I think rates are going to increase and they're going to possibly increase for a prolonged period of time. So you could be getting caught by that. I got caught uh, with interest rates increasing unexpectedly back in 2008 and it really cost me a lot of money. And I can remember feeling this sense of uh, panic when you realize that you can't fix rates any longer at, the, at a rate that you find attractive. I mean, if I had made the decision to fix the rates back before all of this stuff had happened, I could have got a really nice rate. But as soon as you start to worry about rates, it's too late. The fixed rates have risen much, much higher. And so it's very hard to actually accept the rates that are now fixed rates. They're usually much, much more unattractive than the kind of floating rates. Now, there's going to be people out there who sit on the sidelines and decide that they're not going to do anything for the next couple of years and just going to sit back and wait. Now, that could be a mistake as well, because when a market falls like this, that is a huge opportunity. Prices are going to fall back, or certainly that's what happened in the past. Prices fall back because demand falls off. There's going to be a reduced amount of affordability if rates go up, and with reduced affordability there's going to be less property buyers and that means there's going to be more property on the market um, with people that have maybe bought too high interest rates they can't service the interest rate and if they can't service the interest rate they're going to have to sell the property if the property is put on the market and a lot of people are off the you know not on the sidelines any longer and, uh, and, and not buying any longer then there's going to be more properties sitting around waiting for buyers. And so there could be good opportunity here. But don't go out there thinking this is going to be easy. Um, you know, stop thinking things are just automatically going to work out. I think what you need to do is prepare yourself for a tough time and embrace that and actually sort of think to yourself, you know what, I'm tough. I can actually, I can weather this storm because I'm prepared for difficult times. If you go in with a really sort of rosy, optimistic outlook, I think you're going to really struggle. But I think if you go in with your eyes open and say, yes, it's going to be tough, that is why I'm getting into the market. Uh, it's, you know, there's been so many big, huge companies created that were started during major recessions. That is something to bear in mind. You know, there's a reason for that. And if, you, if you're going to go and buy something you got to be very discerning okay make sure that you're not um, falsely building projections you know upward uh, rental projections and things like that into your model make some sort of conservative assumptions uh, assume that you're going to have higher rates of uh, interest obviously you're going to want to assume that maybe rents themselves could fall back a little bit. And the reason is, is that I think the affordability squeeze that's going on, if inflation is running at the level that it's running at, then it's going to mean that people have less spending money in their pockets. And so it could be that rents fall back a little bit. Now, that could be an opportunity. I think I've mentioned in the past HMOs as an opportunity. And... Uh, HMOs, for those of you who don't know what a HMO is, a house of multiple occupancy. And uh, it means that lots and lots of, you know, you basically split a house up into rooms and you rent, rent it per room. And that means that people are paying much, much less rent, but you've got five or six of them in a house instead of one family renting a whole house. 
and that can have an advantage and that can actually make you some good money. Some of my clients in my mastermind are doing that and doing quite well on it. Many of the most successful businesses on the planet, as I mentioned, they started during recession. They figured out how to survive. And then when the market did eventually bounce back, they were absolutely thriving because they had figured out how to survive the difficult times and they built their business around struggle and, and strife. Also bear in mind, and this is just a little bit of an extra thing that just popped into my head, is inno innovation could be something that actually takes off during difficult times. If, for example, let's just use tokenization of real estate or crowdfunding of real estate and stuff like that. If you've looked in the past at this and it didn't really you know, have much momentum, it was probably because the standard way of doing business was too easy. Like if you, if you can go out and borrow money in the market easily, well, then these other methods of investment and financing and stuff probably don't really stand much of a chance. But if we're going into now a couple of years of difficulty and um, you know a lot of banks and lenders and things like that sort of dry up and you don't have the same opportunity to borrow as you did before, then maybe this other stuff, this uh, things like tokenization. I'm actually going to try and get a guest on who specializes in tokenization because I do think that's an interesting area. Anyway, my main message here is to assume it's going to be very, very difficult and to go ahead anyway. Prepare for struggle. Be very discerning about what you buy. Don't get caught out by surprises. Build them into your model. Of course, you don't know what's coming, but you can certainly build a pessimistic outlook and go out looking for you know, opportunities that make certain assumptions of stuff that could go wrong rather than assuming everything will just go rosy. The worst thing that could happen if you have that approach when you start out, the worst thing that can happen is that it'll actually be easier than when you started out thinking it would be. Remember, continuity bias. That's how people get blindsided. They assume the good times will just continue. They don't pay attention to threats and uh, all that kind of stuff. All right, guys, before I go, one quick reminder. I'm starting a new mastermind cohort. It's a six-month program starting in mid-September. Um, I've already had somebody sign up over the weekend. So if you are interested in that, if you do not want to be one of those guys sitting on the sidelines when this mar market opportunity comes along, you could be ready and uh, fully educated and ready to kind of jump into the market in about six months time. If that is of interest to you, reach out to me and, uh, and connect. Guys, until next week, pay attention to the market, pay attention to your mindset and watch your ego and your emotions. And I'll speak to you next week. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you enjoyed this episode or found it useful, please leave a review over on iTunes. Or if you're watching on YouTube, please just like and subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions you'd like to ask me for future videos or whatever, you can join my Facebook group. It's called Behind the Facade Community. Alternatively, look me up on social. I'm, uh, my handle is Gavin J. Gallagher. And you can stay up to date on all the projects I'm working on and various things using my blog, which is gavinjgallagher.com. That's all for now. I'll see you guys next week.